Thanks. How about now? All right. So I'd like to thank the organizers very much for the, uh, the opportunity to speak here, which is a, a great privilege. And you all for, for coming, at least to my talk. Um, so what, I, what I'd like to speak about uh, concerns kind of some of the, the algebraic or geometric structure that I think underlines, underlies a lot of field theory. So this is the kind of question that you know, mathematicians you know, like, to, like to ask about quantum field theory, like what is one or what is the structure of one? So in particular, sort of in a field theory, there are at least two pieces of structure. So the first one um, assigns uh, to, to some suitable manifold of some dimension, uh, one, a collection of operators or observables on X. So this is the one piece of structure. And then the second thing, for each operator, these are some, not just any operators, you can take their trace. And the second piece of structure, uh, this, this trace is valued in some, some ground field, k, like the complex numbers. And these are the two basic pieces of structure that I'd like to, like to focus on. That there are some assignments of operators, and given an operator, you can tra take its trace. These are like collections of observations that can be made, and this trace encodes the partition function or expectation. So here, oh, and I should say before I go on, that everything I say today is joint with David Ayala. Um, so I'd like, to, I'd like to think about what this sort of assignment um, of given some theory, let's call it Z, to consider the assignment of Z of sort of X goes under Z to operators on X. So I'd like to imagine that this is something like a homology theory, because there's some naturality in X. So once we fix a particular field theory, C, uh, Z, so I'd like to imagine this is like a homology theory. I'd ask, and then I'd like to, to, to see if there's some, some juice to that idea. So if it's like a homology theory, you could ask, well, a homology theory on what? So maybe that's a, a way to formulate the question. So the question that everything I talk about today will be an attempt to, to answer is the following. Is there some space, some kind of universal moduli space? Maybe I'll call it M sub X, associated to a manifold X, such that um, for each, such that there's an assignment, you know, field theories on X, and for each field theory, the assignment of taking operators, so Z goes to the collection of operators on Z, uh, produces sheaves on M sub X. Uh, in such a way that, well, uh, what, what the thing that you'd like to ask about these field theories, like taking the trace, calculating expectation, has to do with the homology or cohomology of these sheaves on this universal moduli space. So I'll say such that. Um, so given some. So given some say. Z here, this goes to some C, a sheaf in here, and expectation has to do with the homology of this sheaf, homology or cohomology of this sheaf. 
and structure two, this trace, is naturally defined on this object. Um, so this is, this is the, the, the question I'd like to say. Is there some sense in which operators on X, uh, as, the, as the field theory that you're interested in varies, uh, is captured by some kind of universal moduli space and sheaves thereon? Uh, so so I, I think the ideas that I talk about will be true in, in a lot of generality, but um, all I'm going to talk about today concerns topological field theories. So let me put that here, topological. And then that'll correspond here to, say, constructible sheaves with respect to some filtration on M sub X. So that's the question. Uh, I read an interview with Saunders McLean once, and he described how when he was a student in Germany, it was his job to do that when someone else lectured. <laughs> but I guess Saunders McLean isn't here now. <laughs> um, so, so what are some candidates? What's your first? What's the first candidate for such a thing? Uh, so maybe the first guess. So the first guess might just be x itself for m sub x. First guess for m sub x. Maybe just you could just take the homology of x. Given a field theory, you could think of operators as sheaves on x itself. And the, the homology of x maybe carries some trace map, like integration. And, and that could suffice. So this, this is actually not a bad idea. This is good, uh, for example, for things that are not really that much like field theories, but which are still interesting. Uh, so for example, if you wanted your partition to function to be something like the Euler characteristic, or you wanted it to be the signature of a manifold, the, the signature of the intersection form on a four-end dimensional manifold, or if you want it to be the A hat genus, then in those cases, x itself would work pretty well. This is good. So if the um, good, for example, if the partition function was something like the Euler characteristic or the signature or the A hat genus. In this case, each of these things can be encoded just by the homology or the cohomology of X, by the gauss binet theorem, or by the Hertzsbrook signature theorem, or by the Atiyah Singer index theorem. So if that's the kind of thing that you want to capture, then just x itself will be sufficient. Uh, so in general, these are all additive. They have the property that, for instance, the Euler characteristic of a disjoint union is the sum of the respective Euler characteristics. So that, that's the kind of feature that might tip you off that x itself would be a suitable moduli space in that example. However, that's not generally the case for the, the sorts of things that you might like to study, this additivity. And so x itself is not probably sufficient in general. So then there are a whole bunch of other guesses. Uh, but then I'll just label this one the second guess that I'll write down. is something called the RAND space of x. So the RAND space of x 
is as a set um, just consists of finite non-empty subsets of x. So s equal to x1 to xk, uh, where xi is not equal to xj for i not equal to j. Uh, so it's the collection of all finite subsets just as a set. Um, so it's, uh, but then we're going to topologize it so that points can collide. So it's topologized. so that points can collide. So in other words, I want the following map to be continuous. I'll just take the product of x with itself. So there's the maps from x2 to the RAN space of x uh, that sends, well, a pair xi, xj to the subset xi, xj. If i is not equal to j, if xi is not equal to xj, um, but if they are equal, then just send it to the point xi. So in other words, this 2 is arbitrary. For x to any power n, I can just take the image, and I want those maps to be continuous. So in this sense, points can collide in here. There's a path in here from the point that has two distinct elements to some other point with only one element if x is a connected space. So topologized, so more formally, you can say that this is given the finest topology. Um, uh, such that these maps x to the n mapping to ran x are continuous. And if you've taken point set topology recently, uh, or you've taught point set topology recently, then you know finest means that it has the most open sets, such that, uh, that that's true. So it can't have the discrete topology because maps to things with the discrete topology are not usually continuous. So that's the one. So this is, this might be, so this is another thing. Um, and the RAN space, under a different name, goes back a really long way is it was introduced by Borsuk and Ulam in the 1930s. Uh, and then Bott wrote a paper on the, on the RAN space. It wasn't called the RAN space back then. Bott wrote a paper on the RAN space of the, of the circle. Um, and then it got used in algebraic geometry by Ziv Ran. And Bellinson and Drenfeld called it the RAN space. And I learned about it from Bellinson and Drenfeld's book, so then I called it the RAN space too. All right, so this is, um, so this is. This is good in conformal field theory on curves. Uh, it's used in, in Bellinson and Drenfeld's work. Uh, you can see their book on chiral algebras. And it's also good in perturbative QFT and TQFT. And for this, you can see um, uh, lots of work of Costello, Gwilliam, uh, C. Lee, and others. Uh, in particular, Kevin and, and, and Owen Gwilliam have a, have a book that's recently published, which is a really great reference that if you haven't looked at, you have something to look forward to. Um, so, so why is this good for, for, for these kinds of things? Well, here's the, the rough idea. So 
So if to some field theory, so to, for some um, So let's say that you could construct a sheaf C on the RAN space. And the, the reason that you see these, this, this sort of configuration space of all points, of all uh, configurations of finite points, this will have the property that, well, there's a stock of this sheaf C at um, the point x1 to, say, xk. So this is the stock. And then since it's a sheaf, there's a map from this to the homology of the RAN space of x with coefficients in C by taking global sections. Um, and this is the, the global observable. So this is, I'll call this the factorization homology, or the chiral homology. And this encodes the, um, sitting inside here, there is something naturally a naturally associated element given point observables, which I'll label like O1 tensor O sub k. So if these are uh, point observables, each uh, located at these points, x1 to xk, then this is set up so that that's supposed to define an element. Uh, so here there's the operator product expansion encoded in this element in the, the overall homology. And then this will carry a trace map uh, to the to the ground field, which will have carry the expectation. So that's the way that this is supposed to work. And it works really well in CFT on curves and perturbative QFT. So why doesn't this work absolutely? Um, well, there's a, a few tip. Well, one tip off was that these are all point observables. Uh, so you might ask for line operators or surface operators, or operators supported on you know higher dimensional submanifolds of X. So that might be one thing. Um, and there are other reasons, but which, well, it's not yet convenient to say right now. So let's just go with that, that one motivation for the moment. You'd like to consider operators that are associated not just to, to points. Just, you not just want to check you know, the probability that some particle is located at some point. You have some more interesting operators in mind. And you'd like your moduli space to reflect that more interesting geometry. So th the third and the final guess for today, well, these, this had to do with um, some kind of moduli space of finite subsets, points, in, in X. You want to consider more general subspaces, so it should just be some moduli space of subspaces of, say, positive dimensional subspaces. That sounds kind of gnarly, so we could make it nice, and we say these subspaces are supposed to be nice. And so uh, my definition of a nice subspace will be a stratification. So third guess, m sub x is the moduli space of 
of stratifications. Of X. So now that um, might not look like it's an obvious thing to define uh, because it's not an obvious thing to define. So this should be something where a point in this moduli space is just a stratification of X, but stratifications are allowed to morph one from another in some interesting way. So reflected when we looked at the RAN space, points were allowed to collide. So in this moduli space of stratifications, well, a really simple example of a stratification is just marking out some points. There should be some behavior in how one stratification is allowed to deform into another as you move through this space of stratifications, similar to a way that two points can move together and collide. That's a particular example of one stratification changing into another stratification. So we'd like to see um, We'd like to see that kind of behavior in however we define this moduli space. So here's, so there are a few ways you could go about this. So one is we could define a set, the set of all stratifications of X, and then you could do something like put a Gromov-Hausdorff topology on this set of uh, stratifications. Um, so that would be you know one way of going about it, like actually try to define a metric on this on this set. Uh, so that runs into some problems. So I'm going to describe another way of, uh, of going about what this is. So from, from the Yoneda lemma, you know that to describe an object like a topological space is you can describe maps into it. So I want to describe what MSX is by describing maps into it. In other words, what a map from a point into it is, what a path into it is, what a map from a general space into it is. So the idea is we'll define M sub X, this uh, you know, putative moduli space, um, by defining sort of the maps that we want to allow from K to M sub X for general K. So we'll start with K being a point. So in other words, just to say what an element of the M sub X is, and then we'll let K be a path. So we want to describe what's, what, how, what, how one stratification is allowed to devolve into another one in a continuous one parameter family, and then consider more general case. And that'll allow us to say what this kind of space is in terms of the sort of functor of points that it describes. Yes. OK. So, so first, what is a point of M sub N? Uh, so definition, a point of M sub X is a stratification. Of X. So where, what's a stratification? Well, I won't give you an, a, an exact definition because there's going to be some smoothness conditions that uh, are a little technical to get into, but it's a uh, it's a way of partitioning uh, X uh, into strata. In which each X sub K is a smooth K manifold. And these strata are supposed to sit together in a nice way. Um, so for the exact definition that I want, if you want to know that, you can check it in a paper that I wrote with uh, David Ayala and Hiro Lee Tanaka called Local Structures on Stratified Spaces. Um, and the, the key word is conically smooth for how these s things are supposed to fit together. But in any case, there's some technical condition here. And uh, well, 
put it in. Uh, no, it, so it should be the, the, the same as Whitney Stratified, um, but Whitney Stratified is a notion which is not well suited to talking about families. So what is a, a one parameter family? So it, it's difficult to say what the space of stratified maps between two Whitney Stratified things are. And here we wanna, we're really interested in how things move in families. And um, so this paper was entirely written to solve <laughs> for that problem, to describe how what smooth families should be for stratified things. Pardon me? Definitely. Um, so whatever, whatever this notion is, here are some examples. So in particular, an example should just be um, S and X, a finite subset. That's an example of a stratification. So in this case, X0 is just some points. Uh, well, the points S. Uh, and then the rest of these things are empty. Uh, x k is empty for k less than n and greater than zero, and then x n in this case is just x minus s. So that'll be an example, no problem. Um, the next example you could say a smooth triangulation. in which case the k-dimensional strata are exactly the k-dimensional edges. Or more generally, um, a, a sort of smooth CW structure on X or something associated to a handle decomposition of X. All of these things should be examples of stratifications. So any way, cut, way of cutting X up in a smooth, relatively smooth way should be an example. Pardon me? Uh, for the purpose of this talk, yeah. So the, it, you definitely don't have to, but um, I mean, everyone likes smooth manifolds better than topological manifolds. Oh wait, I'm being recorded. <laughs> no, I mean, either is good, of course. Oh, you can talk about stratified spaces that aren't manifolds, but since we're talking about quantum field theory or uh, on X, then for today, I'll just let it be sm a smooth manifold. Um, okay. So that's all I'll say about what points of M sub X are. Now I'll give, I think, the most, the most interesting thing that I've said so far will be what a path is. So, definition. A path, delta 1 to m sub x. So I'll identify delta 1 as the interval, and delta 1 is itself stratified. And it's stratified in an asymmetric way where just the, the initial point zero is one stratum and the other stratum is everything else. So I want to describe maps from this asymmetrically stratified interval into M sub X. So this is what's known as an exit path. Um, so this is a 
this corresponds to a stratified space E, or maybe I'll write it this, let me write it this way. Well, no, E. Um, over delta 1. such that the fiber, well, over 0 is one thing, E0, I'll write it. The fiber over everything else is and there's some conditions here. So E, as a, as a topological space, let's say, is x times delta 1. However, E is itself stratified. Um, so the stratification, it's going to be some stratification of x times delta 1, where this is the projection onto delta 1. So this is a stratification of x, and this is some other stratification of uh, x times delta 1 minus 0. Now, the, the condition here, the key condition, is that this is a product, splits as a, this map right here splits as a product of stratified spaces. So then the, the condition, this is called being constructible, uh, such that, let's say, E maps to delta is a constructible bundle. Which means that this restriction uh, is a product of any one of the fibers. I'll write this E sub 1 times uh, delta minus 0 as stratified spaces. So the whole thing is a product just as, um, as topological spaces. But once you remove the fiber over 0, I want to require it to be a, a product as stratified spaces. So let me draw some pictures. So what are some pictures of stratified, uh, of, of these constructible bundles? So for simplicity, let's let x just be an interval, d1. So, um, so let's, I'll draw some examples here. of constructible bundles. So here's delta 1, and I'm indicating how I'm regarding it asymmetrically, its stratification. Here's one point, and then the other point. So, the, so all of the pictures as a topological space are going to look like this, but now I'm going to need to, or I'm allowed to, if I want, 
find some finer stratification. So there's one. There's a constructible bundle. So I just found this, decided on this finer stratification uh, by adding that point stratum right there. So now the, the zero dimensional part of the stratification uh, additionally has that point in it. So now this is a product of a, um, this is a pro projection off of a product as topological spaces, but not as stratified spaces. All right, first, actually, let me give an example where it is a product as stratified spaces. So here, this is a product of that times that. So this is projection off a product. So this is a, a kind of trivial example of a constructible bundle. But now, if I don't consider this as part of the one-dimensional stratum, instead consider this picture, um, this is another example of a constructible bundle, because what was the definition of a constructible bundle? Once I look at the complement of, of the map away from the, ze the point zero, it's supposed to be a product. So that's definitely true here, and it's also definitely true here. Um, however, it's not a product as stratified spaces because there's no one-dimensional stratum right there. OK. Any questions about either of those examples? These pictures are really the most important thing that I'm going to say today. So, and they're the thing that should be the easiest to understand. So if, I, if, I don't, if it doesn't make sense, I'd welcome a question. All right, so I'll give you, I'll, let me draw one more example of a constructible bundle. So here, everything is the interval, again, some stratification of the interval. Again, I'll add this little point in the middle, and then I'll add here uh, so these one-dimensional strata. Unfortunately, I don't have any colored chalk. That really, I think, would do it. And again, this will be this projection map. So let's think, is this a constructible bundle? So to say that it's a constructible bundle, we just need to cover up the fiber over 0 and ask, is that map, that projection map down, projection off of a product? Uh, well, once, as soon as you remove this fiber right here, these lines are parallel, uh, since they never actually meet. And again, and indeed, that is projection off of a product as stratified spaces. Like, the stratification is a product stratification. Um, so this part right here is just, well, so yes, this is a constructible bundle, as is this one. So just for, for fun, let me draw maybe a m slightly uh, less trivial looking example. So let's say in this case, x is a circle. Uh, of some refinement, some finer stratification of it. So there's another constructible bundle.
so my, my collaborator, David, likes to tell these um, stories of these constructible bundles you know, as a narrative through time. So I'll, I'll channel him for a moment. So living in this circle are, are four friends, all of whom are you know, separated in, in distance. And as time starts at zero and then moves to epsilon, three of the friends disappear. And the, the, fir and the first one divides in two one of whom more or less continues on a straight path as time goes to one, and the other of whom wanders all the way around um, the, the circle and then stopping someplace nearby. So that's the story of this constructible bundle. Pardon me? No, no. If they ended at the same point, this is key. Um, these friends can never be reunited. Uh, if they ended at the same point, this projection map would no longer be a product because the fiber over this point would now not be the same as the fiber over that point. So that is important. Thank you. Um, so so th this picture, uh, yeah, so this, uh, so this picture, uh, um, so in the RAN space, you, you could think of this as described, uh, since we've only, I've only really just drawn points here, this is like what's happening in the RAN space. And in the RAN space, a point, a path from a point to two things just off the diagonal to one is supposed to describe the operator product expansion there. So that's, that's exactly what's going on here. Uh, okay. Uh, so I've only drawn one-dimensional examples. This, um, let, let me get to it in a little bit. So in general, there's a, um, there's a, a notion of a, I didn't tell you the most general definition, but there's a notion of a constructible bundle. And there's a category call this a theorem. You can find this in our paper, a stratified homotopy hypothesis. So stratified spaces form a category. And this assignment, um, m sub x, you can think of as a functor on this category to spaces. That sends k to, well, what I wanted to say were these maps, sort of in strat, from k to m sub x. And I define this as being uh, constructible bundles over K with fibers uh, which are stratifications of X. So this defines a functor um, by pullback. Given a map K to K prime, send this to the pullback. So part one of the theorem is that constructible bundles pull back, which is actually pretty hard. <laughs> Excuse me? No, it's all stratified spaces. So an object is just, let's say, a manifold. It doesn't have to be a manifold. Um, a, a space with a stratification. All the strata are manif smooth manifolds. Uh, and a map is just something that sends strata to strata, uh, together with some smoothness conditions.
So this um, theorem continued. Uh, such that some things are true. Uh, one is that this is a sheaf. So given any cover of K, a constructible bundle on K is the same as a compatible collection of constructible bundles over each part of the open cover. Um, it's uh, R1 invariant. So constructible. Uh, M sub X of K. The space of constructible bundles on K is homotopy equivalent to the space of constructible bundles on K times R with the strat product stratification. Uh, C, it satisfies descent for blowups. Um, and then a couple other conditions, uh, D and E. Uh, this one, maybe it's something that might be called the Siegel condition, is that the collection of constructible bundles on delta 2, the 2 simplex, which is stratified this way, uh, is homotopy equivalent to the fiber product of those on delta 1 uh, the other delta one, so this one and this one, over uh, delta zero. And then another condition. So it satisfies a bunch of really interesting con conditions. It's not just a sheaf, it's a constructible sheaf that has some really, really strong gluing properties. So now there's good news and there's bad news. So the bad news is, um, so bad news is I've you know, lied to you a little bit. Uh, M sub x, as I've described it, is not really a space. I said it that way because I thought if I, if I was honest and I told you what it really was at the beginning, then you'd be less interested. Um, but the good news is that it's really, for all purposes of things like calculating homology or all, all the reasons that I wanted to use it, it's just as good as a space. Uh, so the good news, maybe I'll call this a theorem, is that there is an equivalence, um, sort of sheaves, on stratified spaces satisfying uh, you know, A, B through E. So those, those pre-sheaves that satisfy all of these conditions, there's actually kind of, this is not, you might think that that's just some newfangled thing that just got cooked up, and it is, but it's a a newfangled thing that we just got cooked up a little less recently. This is equivalent to infinity categories. So this is again a theorem from this paper. So to give yourself a, a space-valued sheaf on stratified spaces satisfying these kinds of conditions, that, that's actually an infinity category, an infinity one category. So I imagine that most of you don't know what an infinity category is, in which case you could just take this as a definition. Um, and I think it's as, it's as good as any other. So, M sub, so it is an infinity category. But that's great because the, the purposes that I, I wanted to use it for had to do with things like taking the homology of a local system on it and this is perfectly, this infinity category is perfectly well suited for that kind of thing.
Ja. The, the usual topology covers by open subspaces. So for any K, and for any cover of any K, it satisfies the sheaf condition. OK, so how does this um, make good on my uh, or original idea that to a field theory, we should have some observables Uh, is the following theorem. This is, I'd say, in progress. So parts of this have appeared in print, and other parts are still being written. So you can consider compatible collections um, of C sub x uh, on all framed and manifolds x. Let me say I'll call these local systems. And maybe I should add a definition first. So the, the sheaf for the local system let's say a v valued local system where say v is it could be spaces, or it could be chain complexes, or something like that. I'll say um, on, on M sub x. So again, I want to continue thinking of this as a, as a, as a, as a space. Um, and so we'll just define this to be a functor from the infinity category to V is a functor. So V values, we'll call this C is a functor C. So co given a compatible collection, sort of C sub x for all framed n, n manifolds x as x varies, well, there's a way of, of getting such a thing. And so this, uh, you can get one from an infinity n category. So there exists, there exists a functor. This functor is, um, I'll call it factorization homology. Where uh, you know, the factorization homology of x with coefficients in C, well, you should think of as being the homology of this space with coefficients in this local system, which we'll define to be the co-limit of the functor, C sub x over m sub x. So there exists a functor. And actually, this is an equivalence. Once I make the, the left-hand side a little more precise. So producing local systems, so infinity n categories, whatever those are, um, uh, they are exactly the way of producing sort of local systems on these moduli space of stratifications. Um, and the way this works is C, uh, when I, if I start with some infinity n category, uh, I'll just call this um, C. The thing here, what is, you know, how does this work? Well, when I'm given a stratification, let me describe a stock here. When I'm given a stratification, well, a stock consists of all ways of labeling each k-dimensional stratum by a k-morphism in C. So a stock of C sub x at a stratification S is what um, labelings of each k stratum. of x by k-morphisms in C. So um, so why is, this, why is this 
a good thing to do, or you know, where's the umph, you might ask. Uh, so the, the value in something like this has to do with how comprehensible this moduli space is. So there, there are two kinds of things that can result. One is that you have something that you want to say is well-defined. You have some way of cooking an invariant up in terms of some extra structure on x, like cutting it up, like in the cobordism hypothesis, and you want to prove that that thing is a well-defined invariant of x. So this is one way of doing that. So this is part of the uh, work that David and I have been doing um, on proving the, the cobordism hypothesis using factorization homology. The other is to apply the geometry of this object to, to something. So then there, there are three principal ways that that kind of geometry can be useful and has been in the case, the, the simpler case where this is the RAN space. So that's in um, descent. You can, for instance, prove the two things are the same by showing that they both satisfy descent over an object like this and that they agree on stocks. The second source is duality. You can ask, what is Verdier duality on M sub X? And that's a source of interesting duality in physical uh, field theories, like I think you'll hear more about in, uh, in Tudor Dimovte's talk. Um, because Verdier du duality on this object M sub X is some generalization of Kazul duality. And then the third source is uh, filtration. This has natural filtrations. The RAN space has natural filtrations. And so you can prove things um, by proving it on layers and then using the fact that the layers glue together. So that's the, those are the four sort of advantages of, of this kind of a thing. Okay, well, thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>